Hello, and welcome to my talk. So, what brought me here? So, ever since I was young, I used to watch a lot of documentaries about environmentalism, and that's given me huge passion for the environment. And I also have a huge passion for technology, and uh, unfortunately, that means I'm the first point of contact for all my family and friends' tech-related queries. But a combination of both technology and environmentalism has brought me here to speak to you guys today. So, the problem. Now, we consume in every aspect of our lives, whether it's buying our morning cup of coffee to buying the latest bit of tech. And this consumption has only increased over time. With this increased consumption combined with our throwaway culture being some of the key driving reasons that climate change is occurring. And this is only going to increase over time, with there to be an estimated 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And another 1.3 billion of the global middle class by 2030, meaning there's going to be more people who have more money, meaning more consumption. Now, this increase in consumption also means an increase in waste, specific, specifically electronic waste. And in 2019, there was 53 million tons of e-waste across the world. And that's a 21% increase from 2014 levels. This makes e-waste the fastest growing part of the domestic waste stream and is a massive challenge for our waste management systems. So with this increase in consumption and the fact that we live on a finite planet means we must look towards sustainable development. So the Brundtland Report describes this as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So here's an image that many of you may be familiar with. And one thing to note is the order. Of, so it's reduce, reuse, then recycle. Now, whilst recycling is great and keeps things in a circular economy, it's a very energy-intensive process, requiring a lot of energy from remanufacturing re to transportation, and not to mention, it's just a very expensive process as well. Now, I'm not telling you guys to stop recycling, please do, <laughs> as it's a, a real vital tool in combating climate change. But we can make an even bigger impact by focusing on reducing and reusing. So that's where right to repair comes in. Now, let me pose a question to the audience. Do we own what we buy? And can we do what we want with the things that we buy? So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a product, and it's in need of repair. So you go back to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer says that it can't be repaired. Or they quote you a price for the repair, which is just extortionately high, meaning you go and buy a whole new device. The essence of right to repair is to have somewhere other than a manufacturer to go have your device repaired. So manufacturers can make this easier by making things like spare parts, tools, manuals, schematics, software updates available to both the consumer and the third party. Now, let me give you guys another example. Let's say you have a laptop. And let's say the A key is a bit sticky, meaning all your emails now read as Ah! <laughs> now, <laughs> from a right to repair point of view, this should be very simple. You should be able to take the broken key away and put a brand new key on so you don't have to go buy a whole new device. And this has a lot of benefits because it means you have longer lasting products, it reduces the amount of e waste, and then there's a reduced demand for new products, meaning there's a reduction in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions caused. And then there's the digital divide. So this is the divide between those who can afford new technology and those who can't, and allows those from less fortunate backgrounds to obtain pieces of technology which otherwise would be out of reach. Now, let me go back to the laptop with a sticky keyboard example. Um, so this was actually from my own personal experience, where I had a laptop and uh, had a few sticky keys, and uh, I couldn't fix it myself. I went to third parties, and they couldn't help me. So I ended up going back to a certain computer company with a half-eaten fruit logo. 
And <laughs> they quoted me a price for repair which was worth more than my entire computer, just for a few defective keys. And this is an example of manufacturers wanting to take control of the repair process and not allow me or third parties to do the repair. So this allows them to set things like the price, provide you with a replacement product instead of you know, fixing the product. And it's gotten even worse in recent years with them stopping third parties from actually doing repairs by not providing information or parts to them, and even going as far as stopping make, well, making deals with part makers so that they only sell parts to the people making the product. And now, this leaves the consumer with two options. To either have the repair, to either spend an extortionate amount on the repair, or to buy a whole new device. Now, there are some reasons that companies may, um, companies might be against repair. So, you know, it may not reach the same quality and safety standards that the company prides itself on. And then there's a privacy concern as well. So, third-party repairs may compromise user data. But this does not justify the anti-repair moves that we've seen in recent years. So one example being, uh, one, example being uh, one example being Tesla. Uh, so basically, Tesla actively blocks VIN numbers of salvaged or altered Tesla vehicles so that they can't receive software updates and they can't be charged on the supercharger network. And then there's the American tractor company, John Deere. So whilst when the farmer buys a tractor, they own the tractor, the farmer does not own the software on the tractor. So when a repair is needed to be done on the tractor, the, the actual tractor blocks, the software on the tractor blocks the farmer from actually being able to repair the device, and meaning you have to go back to John Deere to conduct the repair. So this has made farmers revolt and look into how to hack their own tractors in order to do the repairs. And then there's planned obsolescence. So companies like Apple were found to purposely slow down some of their older devices in later years. And then there's the historical Phoebus cartel. So in the 1920s, several top light bulb manufacturers came together and they artificially reduced the lifespan of a light bulb from 2,500 hours to 1,000 hours. Now, this was a blatant attempt to make more people have to buy more replacement light bulbs. And then there's lobbying. So you may be familiar with many of these companies here. So it's T-Mobile, Johnson & Johnson, Tesla, and many more. And they all actively lobby against right to repair which has slowed down its progress tremendously. And the net worth of all these companies lobbying against right to repair is over $10 trillion. So in the words of Mahatma Gandhi, there is enough on this planet for everyone's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed. So what is being done? Well, there has been some positive steps taken in recent years. So, the UK and EU have legislation which makes spare parts available to both the consumer and third parties for a minimum of two years. And recently, Joe Biden uh, signed an executive order to make, well, to limit the manufacturer's ability to restrict independent repairs on their products. However, these policies are limited to certain devices. But this is making a difference because this pressure from government and people has made companies like Apple. So I can now buy a, let's say I've broken my phone screen, I can now buy a replacement phone screen from Apple, and they'll let me conduct the repair if I feel confident enough, of course, to do it. And I can do the repair myself, and they'll even take the broken part back for it to go be recycled. So this shows that public pressure and policy can make a difference. But we still need more. So what do we need? We need to remove the apathy from repair. So we need everyone to start thinking, can I fix this, instead of going and buying a whole new device. 
And for this, we need changes in policy to make repair even easier. And you can help with this by contacting your local representative and pushing for more effective policy. And repair isn't just limited to electronic devices. Repair is in all aspects of our lives, from clothing to bicycles to children's toys to appliances and everything. So the next time you have a product in need of repair, ask yourself, can I repair it myself? And if you're not sure, there are things like repair cafes, which are growing across the world at the moment. So there's over 1,500 worldwide and around 60-ish in the UK. And basically, they're usually run by a passionate team of people who really care about repair. And 50% of items taken to repair cafes are repaired without the need for any spare parts at all. And they even teach you about repair and maintenance to make your devices last even longer. Fixing more and throwing less just makes more sense in the long term for both the consumer and the environment. And hopefully this pressure will start to make manufacturers take more accountability and make things that make their devices with repair in mind. So, right to repair. It reduces waste. It allows you to keep your devices for longer, which in turn reduces our impact on the environment. It allows more people to have access to devices, especially those from underprivileged backgrounds. And it saves you money on, by repairing a device instead of having to buy a whole new device. So my name is Karanka Kar, and the message I would like to leave you with today is the next time you have a broken product, remember that you have the right to repair. Thank you.